the two things we're talking about today are ADA compliance and uh, then measuring student learning and different uh, studies that were done to and the focus of OER scholarship and measuring student learning and it's really in its infancy. But to begin with, let's talk about ADA. Uh, is the OER textbook accessible? And this is a question we get quite a bit. Um, accessible meaning can a student with a disability read the textbook? And that includes vision impairment, hearing impairment, and other disabilities like dyslexia or ADD and things like that. And this is a question people, faculty often ask about a regular textbook too, a publisher provided textbook. And the response is usually from the publisher, we're working on that. And I guess I have to say OER textbooks are working on that also. Uh, but having a PDF, a free PDF of a textbook gives you a little bit of control over how compliant the textbook might be with disability um, accessibility. Uh, and the bottom line for everything is, of course, you have to go to your own campus and ask your Disability Resource Center uh, if it suits the student's needs, because the disabled needs are wide and varied and uh, different students need different things. But having an electronic copy is certainly a step above just having a printed copy. And I'd also like to point you on my own campus. We have a wonderful office of, dis from, of Disabled Student Center. And we've also got an e-learning office that works closely with them. And they've got uh, several tutorials on how to make Word accessible, PowerPoint accessible, accessible PDFs, and accessible websites. Accessible websites is a little more involved, but really very simple things that can make all these types of documents much more accessible. So I'd just like to point to some resources you could use to check for yourself. If you're wondering, should I use this resource, or you're doing a textbook evaluation and you wonder, is it accessible or not, you can pre-check it a little bit to find out if it looks pretty good or not. And so for PDF documents, there's actually an accessibility checker within Adobe Acrobat. And uh, that link is to a YouTube video that shows you how to do an accessibility check. And the tool, the way you'd access that in the Acrobat menu is go to the Tools drop-down menu, select Accessibility, and then select Full Check. And I'm sorry this is not bigger. I tried to get the whole screen on here. When we re-upload this, Teresa, I'll try to do a better uh, screenshot. But on the right-hand side, you've got what your different possibilities are. And this is where full check is. This is an OER text and information system. And it just shows it in the window, because it'll show you what didn't pass the check. And then this is the results of the Acrobatic Accessibility Checker. And it'll tell you um, if images don't have alternate text, if the title isn't properly tagged so that a screen reader could read it, things have to be properly nested. so a, a reader can navigate through the text and things like that. But very, very simple, quick check. And if you've got 10 items that aren't accessible, then you're doing fantastically well. If you've got a 300-page text with 10 variances, that's a pretty easy fix. If you've got a 100-page text with 100 problems, that's much worse. Word, Microsoft Word, also has an accessibility checker within it. And uh, here's another link to a YouTube video from 2014 by Kurt Chambers in which it shows you how to access that. But if you don't want to sit through a four-minute video, you can go to File, Check for Issues, and then Check Accessibility. And this tool also gives you a report. This is a textbook on uh, management information systems. And you can see the accessibility checker's response, uh, missing alternative text. And this is actually a textbook I use, so we're going to be looking into that with a student assistant soon. And you can see there's 258 cases where the document's missing alternative text. And that is text that's associated with a picture that needs to explain to a screen reader this is uh, what this picture is, because a blind person obviously won't see this image. 
but a screen reader would come across that alternate text and explain it to the blind person what the image they're missing. So it would be very simple to add alternative text to our PDF that says this is a network diagram showing a firewall. Uh, and then other things that are variances with this text that need to be fixed for us to be compliant. Website accessibility checking. A website is much more complex because it might contain forms and navigation uh, that need to be uh, checked and designed in a way that's accessible to a screen reader also. And uh, for people, students who are deaf, they might need alternate text for videos and things like that. So a website accessibility check is a little more involved. And there are online checkers also that will, you can do a pre-check before you accept a source or send it to your Office of Accessibility Compliance. WAVE is a very famous one at webaim.org. And if you go to that website, you can paste in a URL, and it will do the check for you and print out a report, much like we saw for the Word and the PDF documents. And then the W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium, and they have a very lengthy list of tools that are free. Many of them are free to use, and you can use those for accessibility checking. Things like checking contrast on the document, are the tags in the HTML nested the correct way, and those, usually those tools also give you a report and tell you exactly what might be lacking on your website. And this is an example of a WAVE report from the famous site ChemWiki. You're probably familiar with that, Suzanne, I'm sure. And uh, you can see this is the web page that I entered, pasted in the URL. And then you've got a summary over here. And you can click on these different items to find out more about what didn't pass the uh, test. And then whatever's in red is something that you need to look at as a variance to accessibility. And here it says we've got seven errors, but actually the things that are in error are uh, insignificant. They're a search thing and a logo that's not something that relates to a student being able to use the website and everything. But other than that, it's a fairly compliant site, though it might need some work on naming pictures appropriately. Online video. In the study that the California OER Council just did, there were some books that were PDFs, some that were uh, videos, and some that were website-based books. So the student would go in and navigate several web pages to get the content of the book. And I have to say, I didn't check them 100%, but of the few videos I saw in website-based books, they did not have captioning so that uh, deaf person could understand what was going on with the video. And uh, this is an example of uh, the old TV show, Adam 12. And uh, the woman had been robbed, and she's talking about what the suspect looks like, and so on and so forth. And the captioning that YouTube gave us was, Vessel, I OK, it was so, and feel passion which sounds kind of good, feel passion. But what she was saying was, they all look alike and dress alike. So it, didn't, it wasn't an exact match to what the person was saying. And a lot of faculty, you go and talk to them, and they'll say, it has captioning, YouTube captioning. And students love YouTube captioning because they think they're out of the woods, and that will cut it for captioning a video. But clearly, it doesn't. You really have to make sure the videos have captions if you want to be ADA compliant. So my biggest tips on this are go to your campus office of disability resources, because that's the final say in what's useful and what's successful. And they can evaluate things. And they can reformat things so somebody with a disability can actually use that source. Put alt text on everything all the time. And a lot of people don't know what alternative text is, but it's text behind the document in a Word document, a PDF, or a website that describes the picture so that a blind person using a screen reader, once it gets to that picture, they can hear this is what is represented in that picture, and they can use the text as well as a sighted person. And then use headings and uh, subheadings in a proper hierarchy. Someone using a screen reader can navigate through the headings in the text. It gives them sort of a mental roadmap of 
the hierarchy of the material that they're learning. And if you properly define those headers, chances are you're going to meet the uh, accessibility requirement. And it is a very easy thing to do logically when you're designing a text. And hopefully our OER authors have thought of that. Most of them have. Um, and then something that came up during our pilot study, a lot of people had an online text and said, oh, I can't do anything with the text. I can't expand it. I can't make it bigger. And they felt that they couldn't search it. Not a lot of people, but a few people had this problem. But uh, a little bit of instruction on Control Plus, that makes the text grow larger in any web browser. And it's very helpful to a lot of people, particularly for images also, and maybe in a biology text where you'd have a detailed image that would help a student learn. If they know Control Plus, they can zoom in and figure that out. And most students know this. But for those that don't, and for faculty that don't, very, very useful tip. And of course, Control Minus is to reduce it back to its original size. All right, now I'd like to shift gears a little and talk about measuring the impact of OER. And it feels to me like OER has gone through several stages of surveys and studies. And it's kind of gone in waves of awareness and then a lot of studies about quality. And right now, it's just moving into the issues of learning outcomes and our students getting what we expect. And the studies are getting a little more concrete and a little more discipline specific to what students are learning. And so probably the most famous study or set of studies on awareness are the Babson surveys that surveyed faculty in the United States and South Dakota. And uh, a lot of the questions were related to, have you ever heard of OER? Are you aware that there's a free textbook? What's the most important thing that you would look for in an OER textbook? And uh, from those studies, it became very clear that faculty care very deeply about quality. That is the most important thing to them in selecting an OER textbook. Does it really uh, measure up to what the students need? and what the discipline requires, and then that not many faculty are aware of OER. And the California OER Council surveyed faculty in 2014 and discovered in the UC, CCC, and CSU systems, 7% of faculty actually were aware of OER textbooks. Some faculty had said, I've heard of them, but I've never seen one. But really, 7% was the amount of awareness of OER. But that is changing very, very quickly. And then 98% of faculty, they were given a list of things that were important to them, like the textbook cost, uh, learning uh, supplemental materials. But 98% of them said the quality of the book was the most important thing that would convince them to adopt an OER textbook. And I have to say, in our adoption study, people really felt that the quality was there in the books they adopted. So, so then there's a few studies, not tons of them, but a few that focus on student outcomes. And the outcomes are not actually based on the learning outcomes, but on student grades, student failure rate, and student dropout rate. And a couple of studies, one from Virginia, they had nine courses, and they studied the OER versus the traditional text. And they found that students had better grades. They had a lower failure rate. And they had a lower dropout rate. And then the student self-assessment of whether they liked the OER text, they rated it very, very high on quality. Though you give a student a free book, and they have a very, very happy response. And they'll probably say yes to anything. Uh, a study in Arizona in 2013 looked at four courses. And they found that the student results with the OER text versus the traditional text were just the same. And the students, again, had very, very good things to say about the quality of the OER textbook. But faculty, really, who are using an OER text have a lot of buy-in, too. And they say great things about the quality as well. So then measuring the impact of OER. And the California Council, OER Council did an adoption study where we had 16 faculty from the community colleges and the CSU system uh, to keep track of their OER adoption. They could adopt a chapter. 
a couple of chapters or an entire book, and most people in the study did much more than one chapter, and then they reported on issues of quality, obstacles, and uh, student, student perceptions of OER, and the three things I'd say that are highlights of that are how overwhelmingly positive the faculty were for the OER adoption, and they were really, there was a lot of buy-in, and they really felt that it helped the students learn just as effectively as a traditional textbook. The one thing that really took faculty a lot of time to produce, some books don't come with uh, PowerPoints or test banks or support materials, and faculty spend a lot of time creating those, particularly in the courses where they adopted more than one chapter. And they also said, overwhelmingly, there were a couple of people that had trouble implementing it. But most people, most faculty said it was easy to implement. They gave it to the students, and they were hit the ground running. And it was very, very nice to have the students have the textbook even before the first day of class. And uh, that turned out really, really positive. And uh, that uh, study will be released this week, I think, from the OER Council. And you'll, you can look for it on the Cool for Ed site, or I'll add the link in here once it's been released. They also had the 16 faculty in the study produce portfolios about their textbook adoption. And uh, I'll provide a link for those later as well when those are released. They're also uh, included as part of the study. And the survey was done as well. All right, so then the future and where measurement is going, I think, is towards discipline-specific areas and student learning. And there needs to be a, many more studies in this area. And the nice thing for that about a faculty member is if you have a, a yearly annual conference that you go to in your discipline, this might be a very, very great way to publish your results or in a journal specializing in OER issues. So maybe focusing on the student learning objectives and how to measure those and see, showing that those were met. And measuring a traditional course versus an OER tech, a traditional textbook course versus an OER textbook course, and making that comparison and seeing what the differences are and what students perceive the differences are, or the faculty as well. And then lots of the courses have been taught with traditional texts, and then when you make the change, you've got all that historic data of how the students did on final exams, how the students did, what their dropout rate was, and things like that. And you can compare a new section using an OER text, or maybe the second time you offer it with the OER text, so you kind of work out the bugs, and then you compare that group to the historic data. And it's a very easy thing to do to compare those two things. But there's a lot of work. Not many people have done that. So that's an area that's wide open. And that's it for today. So if you've got any questions, please text them to me in the window. Can you hear me, Sandy Chair? If you have a question about accessibility, go right ahead. I'll do my best. Ah, the question is, our DSTS office is very overwhelmed and may not have time to help faculty. Yeah, that's a problem here, too. And sometimes our office, uh, I remember one shocking response I got from them was, well, run it through JAWS, which is a screen reader, and see if it works for you. And what I ended up doing was looking at another university's website to see if it was OK as an accessibility tool. But honestly, it had never gone through our department. Do you have an uh, Office of eLearning? Not with an ADA specialty. Yeah, that's, a, that's an issue. Then the best you can do, I guess, is uh, run those checks yourself, but you're not an ADA expert and you're um, uh, 
your time is limited also. You, you're uh, working on other things. I guess my advice there, but I'm going to punt and say I'm going to check on your question and get back to you, but my advice would be to go to the publisher and ask the publisher, is this textbook accessible? And they should be able to provide you with uh, what they've done for accessibility, and all of them are required to fill out, and I can't remember the name of the form uh, or the report that they do on accessibility, and they should be able to provide that to you. And you probably will run into a publisher that can, like I'm assuming OpenStax would ha be all over this and be very good at accessibility, and then maybe a smaller self-published item or a faculty textbook that says a website might have a little more difficulty coming up with that. Long-term questions. Might a statewide resource be available for OER specifically? Uh, that, I think, is a really great idea. And I will forward that question as a note on the webinars. Um, right now, we're very focused on the 798 and people's um, submissions for that uh, funding. But yeah, a statewide office would certainly be able to help with things like, like accessibility and as a repository, an ongoing repository for things like that. We've certainly had those discussions, but nothing's been decided. Thank you. Thanks for joining us uh, on a Monday morning, and have a beautiful day.